I'd rather start early and just go to the boat tomorrow. We'll go check the traps. And then I think now I gotta go, you know, like around one o'clock into uh, my dad's and James because he wants to get his son in water. <laughs> Sunday, James wants to come over and she said, I want to go first in the morning, but I said, we've got to go and clean up before I come. Folks, you got a couple minutes and then you're going to have to start listening to me. So if you want, just take a deep breath because you got about two minutes till you start to hear me start to babble. So just give me a couple minutes. Well, my uh, phone says it's 5.30, so it's, uh, it's time to kick it off here. And first of all, welcome to the Snook Nook, um, probably the premier tackle store, uh, not even in Southeast Florida, could be in the whole state of Florida, halfway up the East Coast. Um, Freddie and Henry are the owners, they're in the, in the back there, and uh, Henry was he started it way back when, Freddie's taking the reins, and and uh, let's, how about giving Henry a hand here, yeah. because he's, he's the man. That's great. That's great. So, my name is Paul Spurko, and if you didn't come here to listen to me, then you've gone to the wrong seminar. So, this is the only one we're doing here. We're going to talk about Pompano. Uh, Pompano mania is what I'd like to say. I, I do seminars all over Florida. Uh, this time of year, with Pompano is when we could do seminars, when we had the ability, and hopefully next year that'll get back to where, where we can start doing them again, we always had the biggest crowds. Up at Bass Pro, where I do a lot of the Bass Pro stores, we normally get 100 to 125 people every time we did a Pompano seminar. And it's amazing what this fish does to you. But I'll get into that in a couple minutes. Um, I know Dustin, there was there, is there anybody else that was here for the first one, for the first rain event? Okay, just a couple people. Well, the other 33 people are lucky because we ran out, did we not? I uh, mean, we, we got a front that came through and blew us out here in November, and tonight we're being rewarded uh, with, with some good weather. You know, what happened in November is kind of indicative of what's happened here since October, really end of October and November with our conditions. We've had terrible conditions. And uh, you have handouts in front of you, and, and I have an introduction that I put on the first page. And I start out by saying that the Pompano fishing so far has been a little less than spectacular. Normally now, we have some very consistent fishing. It hasn't happened yet. Um, so what we're thinking is going to happen and what all the commercial, professional anglers are, are thinking and saying, they were still catching Pompano north of us, Melbourne, Flagler Beach, Ormond by the Sea, as recently as a week and a half ago. Those fish had no reason to be there. They are normally down here. We have warm water, real warm water, all spring, summer, fall, and in, into winter, and that's probably what uh, what was holding those fish up. I will tell you, 
and I put a post up on my Facebook page that I'm starting to get a little cautiously optimistic because we need consistent fishing. And when I say consistent, and we get into it, this is not the hardest fish to catch, it's the hardest fish to find. That's the trick to pompano fishing. Uh, and my goal tonight, like whenever I do any seminar, I hope everyone here and the folks that are watching on Facebook, I hope you get one tip or one suggestion that you can take with you so the next time you go to the beach, and maybe it's gonna, maybe we have some novices here that are new to it. All I'm hoping to do is give you something that makes your next trip successful. That's that's the only reason. Uh, just I always do a real quick credibility thing since uh, Dustin, you're gonna have to listen to it. Uh, I am from New Jersey. I am not from Florida. I never fished a beach in New Jersey a day that I lived there. I was strictly inshore, offshore, the canyon, the striped bass, bluefish, you name it. And then I came down here, got into the surf fishing, and I have not been on a boat since other than a couple party boats out of the Keys. The, the difference being down here is, and this is what I tell everybody, if you get into surf fishing, especially here on the Treasure Coast, right where we are, but it extends up and down the coast anyway, when I go to the beach, I expect to catch something. I don't hope to catch something. We have a 12-month fishery here, and if everybody here is local or is going to fish local, and you are from up north, this is a blessing because being from New Jersey, going to the beach, if you lived in North Jersey, Central Jersey, I'll give you just a brief synopsis. You jumped in your car, you got on the Garden State Parkway, you paid the tolls all the way down, you got off in uh, Point Pleasant or Brielle, if that's where you were going to Jenkinson's in Point Pleasant, then you found a parking lot, then you had to pay the parking lot, after you paid the tolls, then you had to pay to get on the beach. You got a lot of money invested right away. So what I'm liking that too here is a blessing. These, our beaches right here are free, I predominantly fish from Port St. Lucie Inlet to Fort Pierce Inlet. And the reason I have places that I can fish further north, I do fish Hope Sound in the spring. We get a good pompano run there in the spring, but I can actually find something. We have about 23, 24 beach accesses just between those two inlets. You're probably gonna find something along, uh, along that stretch. <laughs> I'm usually up there four to five days a week. Uh, so if I didn't catch a few, I wouldn't be there four to five days a week. Initially, when I started the first six months, I was getting ready to get the golf clubs out of the garage because I couldn't catch anything. And then I ran into Fred and Woody and Henry, everybody right here at the Snook Nook, and Mr. Uh, Mr. Unbelievable Fisherman got humbled real quick, and I shut the mouth and opened the ears, and ever since then, things seem to seem have worked out up here on the beach. So, what I'm gonna go over tonight, it's not gospel. You might have a better way, a better bait, a better technique. Take what you want from what I'm gonna present, and then at that point, fix it into where it works for you, doesn't work for you, but I will give you some ideas and some thoughts and show you some stuff that has certainly worked for me. Uh, I do, I guide on the beach, I commercial fish for Pompano, and I do, I do seminars, I just love fishing. And if you ever have a question about anything, if you're local, I'm right inside this store from six to 12 every Thursday. You can stop and ask me any question you want at any given time. But the participation in surf fishing here in our area, because I'm also affiliated a little bit with Bass Pro Shops, we have the large, that particular Port St. Lucie Bass Pro has the largest surf fishing revenue of any Bass Pro Shop in the United States of America. Now, it wouldn't be that way if folks like yourself didn't go to the beach and catch something. 
So we have a catch list here on our local beaches that is unsurpassed. Whiting, Croker, Jacks, Bluefish, Spanish Mackerel, Pompano, of course. How about Tarpon, Snook, Permit? We have a bonefish population here now. This past spring, I, I will tell you, and this, some people are going to shudder, we fished a couple beaches during the spring for the Pompano where the bonefish became a nuisance. We were catching them two at a time. So the catch list here, your opportunities, and it's going to change as we go from season to season. The bait supplies, the water temperature, the condition, everything's going to change. But the fish that we're talking about tonight, the Pompano, is without a doubt from October to May, the number one sought after saltwater fish. Whether you're jigging from a boat here with jigs or you're on the beach, whatever you're doing, the snook obviously is the number one sought after fish in this area, saltwater wise, on a 12 month period. But October to May, there's nothing to talk about. It's strictly pompano. So, and I always wonder, and, and I was talking to a couple guys before about it, what, what it is. I mean, what is it about the pompano? People do crazy things. Now, I'm a commercial pompano fisherman, and that's a, that's a different, sometimes there's some fellows here that are doing this commercially that they're making a living doing it. They've been doing it for 30 or 40 years, and uh, they're pretty serious about it. But I've had situations where you get a fist fight because somebody's spiked in, put a sand spike too close to you or to an individual. That happened at Normandy Beach last year, and the sheriff's department ended up there with two commercial fellows. It gets pretty serious, but it, that's not the way to fish. The way to fish is to have fun. I have friends that like to do it recreationally, and I'll get into all the regulations, you know, it's six fish. I've, I've got buddies that if they catch one or two, boy, they hit a home run. They love it. But there's just so much more to this fish, but it just this time of year, it is the fish to catch. Uh, and I did, and I told these same fellows before, and I don't know why. I mean, we're chasing a, a pound and a half fish with 12 foot rods, with four ounce sinkers, and the average is 12 to 13 inches long with a 7,000 size spinning reel. You're not gonna get spooled, but that's what we do because that's what you need to catch these fish. You have to be where they are. And I'm gonna, you'll hear me say this probably, I don't know how many times tonight, it's not, they're not hard to catch, they're hard to find. That's the thing. And they move, they constantly move these fish, these pumping up. A tide change, a water color change, bait supply change, everything that happens with the pompano is geared because they're moving up and down up and down a beach constantly where they were two days ago it, here's here's what here's what i always say if you go back to the same beach where you caught them you get them the first day that's great you go back the second day you catch some more you're okay boy you're pretty darn lucky if you go back a third day to the same beach where you just caught them, you need to run and get your lottery ticket. It doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. Will it happen? Yes. But these fish move so quickly up and down based on conditions that you have to kind of keep up. There's a few ways to do it. You can stop to the tackle stores. There's some websites. Uh, there's the On Foot Angler, Ed Killer, and the TC Pop. So, I use all that information as a starting point when I go fishing. But just because I caught fish, where I, I mean, I'll be honest with you, where I caught fish yesterday, and I, I had a pretty good day with the Pompano yesterday, a couple of buddies of mine went back, commercial guys went back there today, they're still waiting for the first bite. They were going. So this fish, now, if you've never eaten one, they're delicious. They're delicious. The current rate at when I dropped them off, like I said, was $29.99 a pound yesterday. That's got to be part of it. I'm sure that's part of it. But they are fun to catch, and as far as I'm concerned, the thrill is the hunt because you're kind of going to overpower them if you get serious. Will you, can you catch them on a seven-foot spinning rod? Yeah, you can under certain conditions. 
in the springtime predominantly, you can do that. Springtime when the water warms up, they tend to, depending on what beach you're fishing, they tend to come in a little closer to the shore. So they're a little easier to reach. But the two major reasons you're not gonna catch pompano, you can't reach them, or you're fishing in all colored water. And you have, I have a page in there that I'll review with you in a little bit, what to do if you're not catching pompano. Everybody wants to know, you know, everybody wants to know all the information about when you are catching them. When you are catching them, you're probably catching them, the guy next to you, next person down catching them. But what you need to do is pay attention and look for certain things when you are not catching them to increase your chances. And there's also a lot of bycatch involved too. There's a tremendous uh, variety of fishes here this time of year. The whiting, we're getting some nice whiting. There's, we're getting, as I would say, Jersey bluefish were down here. Uh, we're getting bluefish the other day that were six pounds. That, that's pretty big for down here. Uh, Spanish mackerel. So there's a bunch of different fish you can catch if the pompano aren't biting. But I, I will tell you this, most of the people that you see on the beach this time of year are going to target the pompano. What we have the ability to do here, and I'm going to, for the, uh, for the Facebook viewers, I'm going to just normally, everybody's got a handout here, and for the folks that are watching it streaming right now, there will be handouts at the front desk if you couldn't make it tonight while supplies last inside. So if you, if you don't get one, uh, by all means, stop by and get it. And uh, I talked to Alec, and if they run out, you can certainly leave your name and email address, and I will personally email to, for the folks on Facebook this, uh, this handout. I do a new handout for every seminar that I do, whether it's the mullet run, obviously, for one, or snook fishing on the beach, or whatever the case may be. But the, uh, the handouts are yours to keep. You can make notes on them. And for the folks that are watching, please, by all means, please stop by. You know, and, and for everybody that's here, I'm gonna, let's get right into the pompano. And obviously, if you look at your at the handout, and for the, the folks on Facebook, it, it's page three. I kind of like to go over the fish a little bit because there are, this is a regulated fish. You're allowed six pompano. They have to be 11 inches to the fork of the tail, not the overall length. If you, and I've heard the case pleaded to an FWC officer when a couple of guys had, uh, had, they were 11 inches, but unfortunately they were about maybe 10, 10 and a half. They're not too interested in ignorance, so you are gonna get a ticket, so. And personally myself, even commercially, if I get an 11 incher, I'm probably throwing it back. I'm not telling you to do that, my fish have to be iced right away. They have to be under 40 degrees when I drop them off. Um, is there a little bit of shrinkage? There can be. So I, I just, that's a personal thing that I do. Mine got to be at least, they're usually about 11 and a half. Then I start to keep them. Um, their food value. If people are standing in line to pay $30 a pound, they're pretty good. They're pretty good. It's a little different in the back of the handout. I put a few recipes in there that my wife came up with for Pompano that are hands down as far as I'm concerned. If she's watching this, she's going to like this the best. So we have, we have some recipes, but it's a different type of fish to eat. It's very white, very white. I don't want to say it's sweet, but it's, a, it's different. It's a different type of fish, and that's, I think that's why people, uh, people really, really go bonkers over it. I'm going to write down the, my, the, the, normal, the normal list of how we do this. Where do you catch these fish? How far off the beach? If you're fishing, now it's funny, I was in Fort Myers on the weekend with, uh, with Fish Bites, with the company doing a promotion. Totally different on that side. They get Pompano over there, but if anybody's been to the west coast of Florida, they got to go 20 miles off, I think, to get to 10 feet of water. I mean, it's just, we have the deep beaches here. If you're fishing from St. Lucie Inlet to Fort Pierce, like I predominantly do, 
70 to 100 yards, if you want to do it seriously, that's where you need to be. Can you catch fish at 50 yards? Sure you can. Probably a high tide situation. You might have a little, I call them up and down, a little gully or trough that's there. There's some sand fleas, there's some crabs, the pompano in there picking them off. But I tell everybody the same thing. For us to do it commercially, you don't see any of us fishing with rods that are less than 12 feet long. It's gonna, it does a couple different things. Obviously, the most important thing on a, we call them long rods, on a long rod, is distance. It does also, it's got bite detection, a line entry, and I'll go over that when I talk about some of the tackle. But you, if you want to do it seriously, if you want to target, if you just want to get one combo, and you want to catch pompano, I recommend, and I see folks on the beach do that all the time. You know, I fish four rods. You don't have to, especially if you're recreational. Why not just fish one? You'll catch them. But if you can't reach them, you can't catch them. They're going to be off the beach. Now, on that rare occurrence, when they are coming in, yes, you'll get them at 50 yards or 40 yards. If you're new to this, the beaches from St. Lucie to Fort Pierce, right along South Hutchinson Island, I will tell you that the further north you go, the deeper the troughs are closer to the shore. Down this way, I say from the Jensen Circle south, you know, down to St. Lucie or Bathtub Beach, which obviously is still closed, uh, those beaches right there at dead low tide, unless you know how to read those beaches, if you're going to try to fish Bryn Mawr or one of these other beaches that are down here at low tide, you're going to be sitting there twiddling your thumbs because you need a suicidal pompano in about a foot and a half, two feet of water that came in and picked up your bait. The further north you go, the deeper the beaches. Once you get above the power plant, Middle Cove, Blue Heron, Frederick Douglass, John Brooks, and by the way, all these beaches are listed in the back of your handout, and for the folks watching on Facebook, if you go to the St. Lucie County or the Martin County Beach Directory, you have the addresses. I used just to put the, I have distances for the handout from the Jensen Traffic Search Book, because if you're trying to find it in the dark, they have signs out front, but they don't have a lot of lighting, so a lot of times you'll drive right by them. Now with the GPS and all the phones that we have now, there are street addresses for all the phones. Anybody can access it. So if you hear somebody talk about Middle Cove, or you hear somebody talk about Blue Heron, or Porpoise, or Bryn Mawr, they have an address. That's the location that we're talking about. When I fish, and if you're gonna fish local, when I fish the northern beaches, the Blue Herons, the Porpoise, the Surfside, up towards Fort Pierce, I will stagger a rod. Usually two or three of my rods I'm trying to cast to the Bahamas, but that one rod, I will in fact keep that at 60 or 70 yards because you have more water. So I always tell folks when you're first starting, if you're going to fish a couple rods, give one a good, a good heave and maybe just back off on the second cast because the way these, fi these fish normally run north and south up and down the beach. Now, when they pick your bait up, and I'll talk about bite detection a little bit, they, they'll swim your pyramid sinker. You'll think there's nothing on your rod, it's straight up and down. But meanwhile, that fish might be 30 yards from you swimming all the way into the beach. But the point here is if you're going to fish north, feel free to back off on one of the casts. You have an opportunity. So, uh, Or if you're, you've got an 8-foot, 9-foot, 10-foot rod that, you're, that you like and it's one of your favorite rods, you could, you could probably catch a few up there doing that that way. When do we fish? When do you catch the fish? Right now it's winter time. And this is almost like clockwork. Most of the, this year has not been traditional. So I, I want to throw a lot. What's happened all the previous years I'm here, there's a lot not happening like that this year because everything's been just topsy-turvy. Morning bite in the winter. When I say a morning bite, first light, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock. That's usually, if you can catch a high tide, 
in the morning, that's prime time. Back up 24 hours, I fished from, I was, I threw my first lines out in the dark yesterday. <clears throat> now we get to 7 o'clock, we get to 7.30, 8 o'clock, we get about an 8-inch white in it, didn't even know it was on there. I picked it up, made a move to another beach. Well, now it's 9 o'clock, 9.30. The tide turned at around 8. So they should have bit between 7 and 9. Nothing. About 9.30, 10 o'clock, game on. Here they go. My, my first pompano was a doubleheader yesterday. So there's nothing etched in stone. This is fishing. But traditionally and percentage-wise, the winter time, the early morning bite tends to be better. When you get to the spring, that fishery can turn around. Daylight saving time. The folks that fish around, that I fish with, the commercial fellas, I spend most of my spring down in Hope Sound, at the public beach, Bridge Road. They congregate there, there's a reef that kind of holds them in, but it's the other way. You get a high tide in the afternoon, it's like somebody told them, days are longer, the water's getting warmer, you have more fishing time, but the predominant bite, the better bite traditionally in the spring is in the afternoon if you get a high tide. This time of year, it's in the morning. Now, like I said, that didn't work that way yesterday, but it seems that's the way it's been, uh, you know, for the last month or so. And we, again, we haven't had consistent fishing yet because we haven't had the big schools of Pompano that we normally have. I start fishing for these things on Labor Day. I catch a lot of little ones. We, you catch 20 and keep one, but it just, it hasn't been traditional. The mackerel haven't been traditional, uh, and everything, everything is late. But, knock on wood, it appears as if we're getting some more fish into the area. What to look for? This is, this is very, this is important. Two reasons you don't catch pompano. You can't reach them or you're fishing in off-colored water. And when I say off-color, brown, streaky water, dirty water. Pompano are sight feeders, they do not like dirty water. Will you catch a few in dirty water? The key to that is a few. You're not, if you fish dirty water every day, and I'm looking around for clean water, I'm gonna have fish you about 10 to one. And there's a couple different colors to look for. I call it one's powdery blue. You know, the, uh, the, the gin clear, I call it uh, swim fins and snorkel water. And we get that in the spring where it's real clear and real blue, not too good for pompano. They got great eyesight. Powdery blue. If you can get any kind of bluish color and a little bit of milkiness in there, throw them out you got a good chance. And the other color is what I call a clean green. It's a lighter green. When we start to see darker green water this time of year, usually the darker green water means some kind of temperature change, and that darker green water is going to be colder. But the light green, little bit of murkiness, throw them out. Again, I'm going to go back to yesterday because it's fresh in my mind. We walked up on the beach where I ended up, water was super clear, clear as I've seen it this winter. And I'm saying, boy, I don't know. But there was a little bit of murkiness offshore of the clean water. Well, apparently they didn't bother them because they were in that water. But uh, any type of clean, I call it clean green or powdery blue, if you see that color water, you stand a chance. It doesn't mean they're gonna be there because the first spot I tried yesterday, I had that real nice light green and I say I caught two whiting that were about this big. Two of them together wouldn't have made dinner. So it all depends. It all depends. They got to be there, but at least if you find the right water, you definitely stand a chance. We get west wind. We've been getting a lot of northwest wind and west wind. And I, I will tell you the, the saying on the beach for some of my buddies, first day of the west is the best. After that, not too good. 
West wind makes for very calm conditions. If you're boating or you go offshore, you get a light westerly breeze. It makes the surf very calm. The best wave height action you can get is a two to three foot, little bit chop out of the east, southeast, northeast, it doesn't make any difference, but two to three. And the reason for that is that little bit of wave action allows your sinker to hold, but it also stirs up the bottom. Favorite food, natural food of Pompano, sand fleas, mole crabs, obviously, you know, we call them sand fleas. They eat clams, they eat the small crabs. When we fish down in Hope Sound in the spring, the white calico crabs become a nuisance. You break a knuckle off, you put it on your hook, you catch a pompano. A little bit of wave action gives them the food chain. It will disperse and just roil up the bottom enough that they pick these baits up off the bottom. But dead calm, you're not getting any of that. So you got to get a pod that's swimming by and sees your bait. But you see that, you know, everybody likes to have a calm. But I like, and most of us that do it a lot, like a little bit of wave action. Now, four to six, we're not interested in. That two to three, wind out of the east, you're probably going to have yourself a day if there's some fish around. How do we catch them? I, I call multiple hook rigs, uh, dropper loop. What we've got these are rigs, and I'll show the folks on Facebook. These are rigs, pompano rigs that I I happen to tie, and there's a lot, there's a million kind of pompano rigs. I personally like the dropper loop with a float, a bead, and a small number one circle hook. Obviously, your sinker snaps on the bottom. You've got two dropper loops, and I'll go into the baits here a little bit, but that's a standard pompano rig. There's all different types of pompano rigs, and they're all set up differently. There's a lot of a lot of guys that'll tie them with a hook here and another one way up here. Some people use three hooks, but this is just, I call it a high-low rig. You call it whatever you want, but I, I called a, a two-set dropper loop that I tie here. I don't particularly like having the hook, this top hook, up high. I just, we just went over what, what do they eat? They eat crabs. They eat sand fleas, they eat clams. I don't see a lot of them swimming in the upper water column. Where are they finding that food? They're finding it near the bottom. So I like to have them, and I then some some guys that I fish with like a big distance between the two. I don't, and the reason yesterday was a perfect example. I think with the two hooks closer together. The first fish, two fish I caught yesterday were on one cast. Having two hooks close together, one sees the other one, your chances of a double header, I think, are greatly increased. I like the hooks closer together. And I'm going to give, uh, and, and everybody has different thoughts on hooks. These are, these are my rigs that Freddie's got inside, and I'm going to use Freddie's quote, small hooks catch big fish. These little number one circles, they're number one mustads. I catch permit in the spring on them, and I caught some even in the fall, up to about 28 pounds on this num number one circle hook. They're strong hooks. We also have other variety of fishes that if you use a 2-0 or a 3-0 kale hook, traditional, or even a 2-0 or 3-0 circle hook, the whiting, the croaker, which are, by the way, delicious. They can't get that hook in their mouth. So if you, you want your broad to bend, I like the smaller hook because your chances of catching other types of fish, because there's one reason, you, if you're up there throwing your line out, yes, you want to catch pompano, 
but if the pompano aren't biting, I want to see the rod moving. So I, I want bites, and I want to catch some fish. But that's why I use, personally, number one circle hooks. There's a lot of us using these smaller hooks now. Uh, it's, they're strong, and the other, th the other thing, when I get into the baits, obviously, I'm gonna be biased a bit because I'm, I'm with fish bites on their, on their pro staff. But I'll show you, because I have it set up on there, on the one rig over here, I set, I only fish fish bites on two of my rigs. No, no, not, this happens to have a sand flea on them, we'll talk about it in a little bit. But a little bit longer piece, and I cut a tail in it, but the small hook, there you go, perfect. But the small hook allows movement of the fish bite. I actually, and I'll show you here in a couple minutes, I actually, whether it's a pre-cut strip or it's a diamond shape that I use, I cut a tail in it, in the fish bite, and it actually, it'll flutter. But if you use a 2-0 or a 3-0 hook, these bigger hooks, you're going to infringe on the action of that fish bite waving in the water. It's just going to lay because the hook outweighs that bait by a lot. But this is your typical rig, and there's, there's a million kind of pompano rigs, but that's the type you want to use. Two hook rig, dropper loops, floats, and beads. And that's, that's just the rig. Color-wise, there's a lot. Boy, you talk to 10 different people, they're going to give you 10 different answers as to what colors we use. I'm a big chartreuse and white person for the Pompano. I'm, I make a lot of rigs for fish bites. For some, I sent some red floats up there this year with the Pompano. Those guys up there are screaming for them because they're catching Pompano, the reds. So, on certain days, yes, I think it makes a difference. Certain days it doesn't. Their sight feed, their floats, their fish attractors, that's what you want. I always use a ruby red bead. The thought process behind that is the mole crab or the sand flea that I have on there, their egg sac is that ruby reddish orange and they see that color and the, the thought is from all my commercial buddies is for years they've been using that color because they think they're looking at an egg sac from, from, a, from a mole crib or a sand flea. Sinkers, very important. There's a couple different types of sinkers. There's your standard pyramid type, which is right here. During the winter here, myself, calm or whatever, I start every day with a four ounce. Pompano like stationary baits. They don't like baits moving. I need something to hold the bottom. So four ounce is my go-to on a daily basis. There are different types of sinkers. Obviously, if you go offshore, there's egg sinkers. There's bank sinkers if you're doing bottom fishing for grouper or whatever the case may be. These are bank sinkers. Leave them at home. You, you are not going to use them when you're pompano fishing. But the other, the other sinker that gets a lot of play, this is the winter time in our area. We get wind, we get surf, we get it all. This is what they call a Sputnik or a spider sinker. And it's just good timing. The Snook Nook, Freddie, just started handling. These are Sputnik sinkers made by a company called the Sinker Guy up in North Florida. I've used every kind of Sputnik sinker in the world. I will tell you I'm using these now on days when I don't need them. The whole idea of a Sputnik, a four ounce Sputnik, that it will hold like a five or a six ounce pyramid. And the reason it holds is because of the arms on them. And the arms themselves, once you start to reel in, they release. So this will actually come right back to the beach without being hung up in the sand. 
but in a windy or a day, anytime I see beach hazard statement comes up on my phone in the morning and there's going to be some current, I know I'm going to go with the Sputniks. But these new ones, and this is what they call, this is a long tail Sputnik. For whatever reason, these sinkers cast 100% better than any Sputnik I've ever used. And the nice thing about them is if you've never used Sputniks before, most of the Sputnik sinkers that you find are spider sinkers. On the arms, they actually have to lock into place on the lead. This company, this sinker guy company, his name is Chip Rundage that owns it, he's a commercial pompano vigilant. He has sleeves on there. Now the beads that we've been using for years, I would take my new Sputniks home put a piece or a, a drop of crazy glue because you need them on the arm at the bend where the where the arm goes out because the beads would fall off. Well, once the beads fall off, it holds the holding power of the sinker. It's useless. This has a sleeve. It can't come off. But I, I will tell you, I've only been using them. Freddie just got them here a couple weeks ago, and I will tell you, we are this... Snook Nook is the only tackle store in the area that's got them. The guys up north, the commercial fishermen, the pompano fishermen, this is all you see. But they cast beautifully. Obviously what happens, you cast it out. And let me tell you about the first time I used my Sputnik sinkers. Mr. Big Shot here again, I know what I'm doing. Well, I bought them in there, they're a couple bucks more. But cast it out doesn't hold. I can't get it to hold. Do yourself a favor. Make sure the first time you use them or when you bring them back in, you put the arms back in position. Don't try to take them back to the tackle store because they'll laugh at you. They have to be in this position to cast. Obviously the sinker goes in, the arms hold in the sand, your bait will stay stationary. But the aerodynamics of this particular type are just unbelievable and they are so easy to cast. You also get some roll out of the straight line ones that don't have the long tail Sputniks. And what happens on the reel end, they tend to tumble. And if your bottom hook is down a little bit, you end up wrapped around the sinker. I have yet to wrap a hook around the sinker. I've been using them now you know, for the last two or three weeks, and I tell you, I absolutely love them. But you, you certainly, you certainly want to use these if you have current or heavy wave action. This will hold like a five or a six ounce uh, pyramid. It has much better holding power. Stationary bait, remember that. That's, that's what you want. Sand spikes. You're, if you're going, to, if you just get one or you get four rods, you're going to be using even a 10 foot rod, a 10, 11, a 12, 12 foot rod. You are not going to hold that rod all day. That's not going to happen. Sand spikes are a must for pompano fishing if you're going to do it. I personally like the aluminum ones. You can get PVC ones with aluminum stanchions on them. I like the aluminum ones. And if you're using anything over 11 foot, 48 inch sand spike as far as I'm concerned, is as small as you want to go. And there's a couple different reasons. Number one, we have a lot of sharks around that will, they have a tendency to every once in a while grab a pompano or two on you. Well, I don't, I can't tell you how many times I've seen somebody with a straight PVC 36 inch with an 11 or 12 foot rod when that shark grabs it and undoubtedly the the person at that time had to drag too tight. Well, that's like the Canaveral Space Launch, because once that sand spike starts to go over and there's the drag is too tight, your rod and reel are headed to the Bahamas. But the, the whole situation about having the smaller sand spikes, they don't have the backbone, and you also want, when I get into the rods here in a minute, from a bite detection standpoint, that's this is what you want. So I recommend it. If you want, if you want it, try the 36s with the straight PVCs. Be my guest. 
I'm actually, Fred just uh, just got these. These are, those are actually 60 inch there. Um, I'm using four of them right now. And they're, I don't think Jaws could pull that thing over. So it's, uh, but they sit up higher. You want them sit up higher. The aluminum themselves, I will tell you, penetrates the sand a little easier. It's got a little more weight to it. These, this one actually has a step on it. So you, when you put it in there, you can just you talk to 10 different people. You're going to get 10 different stories. I'm just going to talk about line right now, not reels yet. And the line that I personally use, and a lot of the fellows that I fish with, and a lot of my friends use, is 15 pound monofilm, high vis. 15 pound. You, you heard me right. And of course, the argument is why don't we use braid? Here's my answer to that. One of the best qualities of braid is the no stretch. If you're fishing the catwalk, you're fishing the docks around here for snook, you're fishing the mangroves for trout, redfish, whatever the case may be, you hook a big one, you need to turn them, you don't want any stretch. Well, here's what happens with the braid. Yes, it's a smaller diameter line, and yes, it will cast further, but if you're using a 12-foot rod, if you're using a 12-foot rod, and you've got braid on on there, you're not going to get any stretch. Even with a shock leader or a top shot, you're still, if you're fishing 70 to 100 yards out, there's a lot of braid in the water. The line needs to be tight. If that in fact happens with the no stretch on the braid, you're going to get into a situation that we call you'll sink or walk. You will actually because the braid doesn't stretch, you'll actually walk that sinker out of the bottom and maybe just a 12 inch circumference, but the bait will be moving ever so slightly. This is not like jigging the pompano on where you gotta jig them up and down here with the pompano jigs on the, on the bridge or in the river. You want a stationary bait. Stationary bait, gray line, depending on the conditions, wind, waves, current, your bait's going to move. Now, I, we use, there are a lot of fellows that I fish with, I use high-vis yellow. It's funny, you see a lot of high-vis yellow down this way from the folks that, that do it seriously on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you get above Daytona Beach, you see a lot of black mono. It has nothing to do with fishing. It has everything to do because your line is so far off the beach You've seen the squadrons of pelicans that come up the beach. They can see that. If you're fishing clear, they can't see it. A pelican 80 yards off the beach is no fun. They get wrapped in the line and everything else. And you will see them, you know, sometimes you'll see people wave them off and they will wave off. But the high vis line has a tendency they will actually come up and veer and go around your line. They can actually see it. But the diameter on the 15 pound is perfect from a casting standpoint. If you want to use braid, I, I never poo-hoo it. I just give you the reasons why, why we use, uh, why we use uh, monofilm. Now, I don't want high vis yellow going down to my leader. I use 30 pound fluorocarbon, about an eight, eight foot section, depending on I just got a couple new rods that are a little longer, eight to 10 feet. The knot that I use to splice the lines together is a blood knot. And the reason I like a blood knot, if you look it up, it has a very low profile. So from a casting standpoint, going through the guides, you won't have any issue. You can use a double uni knot I mean, there's, there's other knots you can use to splice uh, monofilm and monofilm, or monofilm with fluorocarbon. I actually use, I actually use fluorocarbon, 30-pound fluorocarbon for my uh, shock leader. It's called a shock leader, um, only because fluorocarbon is fluorocarbon and supposedly it's invisible, so that's why I use it. I got buddies that think I'm crazy because you don't need it, but I do use that. But 30-pound is what I'm using for the shock leader, 8 to 10, and the reason for that is if you're casting a you know four or five even a six ounce weight 
and you got it tied direct to 15 pound test, you will make the longest cast of your life. It just won't be attached to anything because it's going to snap off and that will be in the Bahamas. So what you need to do is put a shock leader on and obviously for bigger fish, if you, you know, if you hook a big permit, anything that's bigger than that pound and a half, two pound pompano, you've got 30 pound on there on that end on the tied to the rig and you got a much better chance of, uh, you got a much better chance of catching the fish. All right, let, let me let me talk about rods. Um, let me get this so the people at Facebook Live can see it. Here's the setup. It's a 12 footer, and obviously you can't see it all the way up, but this. This is the way it's set up. Now, traditionally, conventionals, I'll talk about reels here in a minute, but this 12-footer with the longer, and all of them have longer butts. And the reason that we use 12-foot rods, distance, line entry. And what I mean by line entry, using these longer rods, when your line comes off the tip of your pole into the water, we have, especially in our area, because we have some deeper troughs in close, that beach break, you want your line as taut as possible going to your bait. If your line is subject to the beach break waves, you're going to get constant pounding, and what happens, it gets slacker and slacker and slacker. Bite detection. You're not even going to know sometimes if you get a bite. I say Pompano are known for picking that bait up, swimming right at you. So the longer rods, distance, line entry, bite detection. That's why you use them. Obviously, number one is, is distance. And when we talk about that, every one of my setups, when I when I am you come fish with me, you will see all four of my rods. And the way they're set up in the sand spike, and it's hard, it's gonna be hard to see here in the dark, I have tension on them to the point where the tip, it looks tight. I know at any given time, if I take a look at a rod, I could be turning around to get a piece of bait, but if any of my rods are straight up and down, just like they are when I put this back in the sand spike, or in the, uh, in the cart, I either have a fish on or I missed one because there is no way my, any of my setups are going to be slack unless something has happened. Best, best way to keep, uh, keep track of what's going on. I, I fished next to some folks that, that were new to it. I fished next to a fellow there about a month ago. He probably had a pompano on there for about 25 minutes. He never even knew it because the line was straight up and down. I knew he had a fish because I saw the rod go down, but then I thought he lost it. Well, he finally went to check his bait and he reeled it in, the rod doubles over. That pompano, he, that poor son of a gun, he was on here the whole, the whole time. But if you keep the line taut, you won't miss any action. You might miss the fish, but chances are, there are good chances, especially if you're using the circle hooks, they will bite hard and they'll still be on the line. So that's why we use 12s. Distance, line entry, bite detection. And I always say the same thing. You don't see any commercial pompano fishermen anywhere in the state of Florida with four seven-foot rods out. They've all got the long rods. That's the reason for it. There's a lot of good brands of rods. Penn, I'm biased. I'm affiliated with them. Tsunami makes a great, great rod. Uh, you know, there's it goes on and on and on. The, a lot of the products now are, are really, really top shelf stuff. But you want something that's got a little bit of whip to it. And I'll talk about that long distance casting in a couple minutes. 
but you want something that you can load. Loading the rod up gives you distance. That's the whole deal about it. But the longer rods, some are heavy action, some are medium heavy. You got to get one that, that you kind of like. Is what it comes to. But there are a whole bunch of, of different manufacturers. When I started doing this, you know, I don't know how many years ago it is now. Um, from a real standpoint, conventional, you'll see a lot of the dyed in the wool folks that are doing this commercially using a Squall 15, an Abu Blue Yonder, Akios is a good is a good company. The conventional reels for years, they're direct drive. They have what they call free floating spindles. When you disengage it, the gears disengage from the spool. Now, I guide on the beach. I take folks on the beach. When I was using the squalls before the current spinning reels came out, I would spend half the trip, it's a four hour trip, I spent half the trip teaching them if they wanted to learn to cast a conventional. I also brought an extra spool of lime with me because the profession, I call them professional overruns. When the bird's nest comes up this high, all you're doing is cutting and pulling. They are a little bit harder to master from a casting standpoint and there are people be using them forever. But Manufacturers got smart. They came out with what they call spinning long cast reels. The difference between a long cast reel and a standard spinning reel, basically, is the size of the spool. The spool is taller and it's wider. Penn was the first one to come out with it. I used four 7500 spin fisher long cast. And here's the whole concept. The, one of the reasons that the conventionals cast so far is because the line lay, the way the line comes in on the spool, it, the oscillation on the reel is slower. You're not gonna go speed jigging for black fin tuna with one of these conventional, uh, uh, long, or, uh, conventional reels that Akios or somebody makes. It's not gonna happen. It's a slower retreat. The long cast from a spinning standpoint is a slower retreat. But the oscillation or the way the line lay is it goes up and down nice and easy. So when you go to cast, Penn makes the claim, and I believe it because I've been using them since they first came out, the friction on the line that comes off your reel over a standard spool, a 7,000 size spin fisher or 75 non-long cast and a 75 long cast, 50% less friction. I, I will tell you, and also if you're trying to teach somebody how to do it, spinning reels a lot easier to master. And you're not going to get the professional overruns, and it takes a little time to get used to trying to throw at 70 or 100 yards, but you're not going to have the mistakes that you're going to make with the conventional reel. I love them. I, I will cast with anybody on the beach with my long cast reels. So. They have kind of revolution, and every year they seem to get a little better. Penn now makes conflicts with long casts. They also make a 6500. 6500 is a pretty nice reel. It's a little lighter. The spool's just a little bit smaller than the 7500, but they are very easy to use. I can take people on the beach, and within 15 minutes, I got them casting. And I don't have any line that I got to cut off, and they're in the game. So. Long cast spinning reels, don't look the other way because it's a spinning reel. I'm fishing four of them, and there's a lot of us on the beach that are now using them because they cast so well. Again, you're not worried about the drag burning out on a pound and a half fish when you've got a 7,000 size reel. It's not going to happen. The reason for the reel is being able to put you in a position to reach the fish. Bait. Let's talk about bait for a couple minutes. And boy, this, this, this can be debated all over the place. I have some, some friends of mine that, that do it for a living that swear the only thing that catch pompano are sand fleas. A, 
couple of my closer friends that do it for a living still bring sand fleas, but the Fish Bites Company has kind of revolutionized that. Fish Bites, if you're not familiar with them, are an artificial bait in different scents and colors. They look like bubble gum. You can either cut them into pieces or they have pre-cut sizes. They're already cut for you. I'm, I'm going to tell you, this has changed the way people fish for pompano. Pompano is probably the number one targeted fish with fish bites, and boy, does it work. Here's what I set up when I fish. I have four rods. My first two are set up with fish bites only. I will change the scent, I will change the color. Easy Flea and Yellow Crab, the last couple of years here in our market, has been the baits, number one and number two. Also, we use the fish bites with natural baits. I'll show the people on Facebook and you can come up and take a look afterwards. Here I've got I've got a, uh, a fish bite bait with the sand flea. You put the sand flea on first, then you put the fish bite bait. With if you're going to use it, every one of my rods, every one of my baits that I have in the water has a fish bite bait on it. The nice thing about the fish bite bait, whether you're going to use a clam strip, salted clam strips are, are pretty good bait. This time of year they get, they draw a lot of attraction from the bluefish if you're not trying to catch bluefish. But sand flea, with a sand flea I try to match the scent with the bait. Any type of crab scent goes with the sand flea. But the nice thing about the fish bite bait and the piece that you're going to use when you use a natural bait, you don't need the big strip. You can use half the size. You put the bait on first, like I have it, then put the fish bite bait on. It does two things. Number one, it will cushion the bait on the hook. I don't care how good you are, how many times you do it, when you cast, you are going to get, especially when you're trying to cast a long rod, you're going to cast the bait off. Sand fleas, if you got live sand fleas, and we've had a bunch around, they stay on the hook much better. But if you're going to use frozen or blanched ones like these are, the shells get harder after you cook them. They call these cookies is what they call them, these type of sand fleas when they're cooked. But you're going to cast them off. But what the fish bite bait does, it'll cushion you will cast probably 60 70 percent less off flying off of your hook with the fish bite bait on than if there's nothing on there. And the other factor that you have to think about is white cal you know, white calico crabs, small white eating croaker, they will peck away at your natural bait. The fish bites bait in the center has a cheesecloth. You ca I carry a little pair of braid scissors with me because once it's dissolved or you've, you've caught a couple fish on them, you need to cut the cheesecloth. It's biodegradable. It'll, it will disperse. But the point here is if a crab or a smaller fish gets your bait off the hook, guess what? The fish bite's still on there. You're still fishing. You're not sitting out there for 15 or 20 minutes with no bait on the hook. It helps the bait stay on, and it continues to let you fish. You're always throwing a scent. They're easy to store. You put them in your refrigerator. They don't smell. They'll last forever in your refrigerator. And I'll tell you, we had this conversation with a couple people down at Fort Myers last weekend. Said I found a fish bite, a bag of fish bites that was a year old. I left it in the heat. It was like uh, beef jerky. It'll still work. You're going to lose the color. The coolness will keep the color perfect. It could be in your refrigerator for five years. It's going to look brand new. The theory or the premise of the fish bite 
once it gets hydrated and gets wet is when the scent is emitted. That's when it starts. It takes longer on a beef jerky type one that you've had forever, but it'll still work. It will always have the scent. The fellow who developed the fish bite was a marine biologist for the University of Florida. He DNA'd all these sand fleas and shrimp and everything else, and then they make colors for them, because colors on certain days will make a difference. But the scent is the scent. If you keep them in the refrigerator, not the freezer, they don't recommend you keep it in the freezer, just leave them in the refrigerator. All you have to do is keep it cool. This bait, I mean, I, I will go through, if the fishing's good, I'm gonna go through two bags of bait in a day. Pre-cut them before you go to the beach. You don't wanna be in the middle of a bite if you got the long strips. All of a sudden the fishing gets good and you're sitting there cutting baits. I cut them and I'll, I'll be happy to show everybody uh, right here. Even the pre-cut strips, I will cut a tail in it. It comes flat. I cut the other one into a diamond, approximately the same length, which is a little over an inch. But that diamond, I put a tail in the bottom, the hook goes through the top, and that's where you get that action. It will make a difference. You hold that in that first trough, if you've got any current running, you'll actually see the bait move. This stuff really works. This is not a gimmick. I, you know, I see skeptics all the time, whether it's in here or wherever else I'm talking to, but it's pretty well accepted now from all the Pompano community that fish bites works. We, everyone, you know, they run up here with uh, Freddie and Henry's tent sale. You run buy two bags, get one free. You usually got to limit the people to 20 bags because you'll get you'll get some uh, commercial Pompano fishermen want to come in and buy 100, 150 bags because they're getting X amount free, everybody's using it. But it catches everything. That's the other thing. It'll catch whiting, it'll catch croaker, it catches bluefish, it catches Spanish mackerel. My son Rainey got a couple nice snook on him this summer on the beach with a fish bite bait. It throws a scent. It's not a gimmick, but it's it's absolutely a great, great bait. Sand fleas, I'll get off because uh I didn't mention this in the beginning. You're, gonna, you're getting a, about a two and a half hour uh, uh, seminar in about an hour. That's usually what my Pompano one lasts, so I want, I want to hit the main bullet points. Sand fleas, obviously, if you see them on the beach, <clears throat> you folks that are here, you can see I have a picture of what they look like. When I was a kid in Jersey, you used to say, oh, the air bubbles are up, those are sand fleas. No, that's not what it is. Little V's stick up, they got V's in them. Get a sand flea rake, you can rake them. You can put them on alive if you can catch them. Some days they're so plentiful, you can scoop them up with your hands. If not, I put an instruction in there on how to cook them. You don't want to cook them too long. You've cooked the sand flea right. This is what you do in a nutshell. You take a little inexpensive chum bag, like Freddie sells inside. You put the sand fleas in there. You have a pot of boiling water and a also a container of ice water on the on the counter. Probably don't want to do this in the kitchen too often if you're, they tend to smell just a little bit. But anyway, you, you put them in there, you boil them, but you're only gonna boil them till you see them start to turn that orangey color. If you cook them too long, you'll ruin them. But once they start to turn, and it could be anywhere from, depending on how hot your water is, from five to 15 seconds, you take them out, put them right into the ice water. You'll know you cooked them right because then you freeze them. And after you freeze them, if you open up the bag and you put your hand in to get some frozen sand fleas, and they're individual, they're not all frozen together, you've cooked them right. When, you're, when they're perfect, that's what happens. They will not stick together. I then, when I go to the beach, you want, what we do, we wash them. What you do, just get some salt water in a small bucket, put them in the salt water, rinse them off. I actually keep them in my pocket during the day. Remember to take them out. Not, not a good thing 
down the road, day, day and a half later in the washing machine. You could ask my wife about that one. But sand fleas are a great bait. Clam strips. If you're from up north, you're used to, clam strips work great for popping up. Small piece. But if you're from up north, we're used to the bait clams, you can't pull apart with your hands. Here they're like soup. I cut them into pieces after I, when I get a, a, a bag of clams, I cut them into small pieces, about an inch long, put them in a Tupperware container on a paper towel. As they tend to thaw out, you damp them dry, load them with kosher salt, leave them in the garage in a container overnight, they're ready to use the next day. You can then freeze them, unfreeze them, freeze them, unfreeze them. They'll, they're fine, once, but you gotta toughen them up because uh, if you don't, you're just going to cast them right off your hook. Let's talk about fighting and landing a pompano. You see a lot of people, a lot of people that I take, that I guide on the beach, they get very excited. And traditionally, if you've ever fished for anything else, you're, the rod goes up, you reel down. You lift up, you reel down. When I hook a pompano, I yank the rod, pick it up out, I point the rod at the fish. You do not want a tight, tight drag on a pompano. Let him do what he wants to do. They, you will almost always know it's a pompano. They have, will have a tendency, they will not go east, they'll swim north and south. And a lot of that depends on the current of the water. But you have to have enough pressure, obviously, to be able to keep getting turns on them but you don't want to horse them in. And the reason for that is these are wide fish. They turn sideways. You've got a 12 foot rod, you've got pressure. So what you're gonna do, you're gonna point the rod at the fish. Slow, I tell everybody the first day they're with me, slow and steady is gonna win this race. Take your time, follow your fish, a lot of times especially the bigger ones, they'll, they'll run you up the beach here a little bit. So what you gotta do, you gotta follow them a little bit. But a lot of these fish are lost when the folks get them in the wash. Now you gotta remember, I've got an eight to 10 foot shock leader that's clear, I got bright yellow line. When I see the shock leader, if we get in some beach break, I tell or show the folks, put the tip down almost to the sand but keep it tight. The tendency is, wow, there's my pompano. I'm lifting him right up like I would any other fish. Guess what? You got two things working against you. You got the backwash. The wave came in, but that water's going back out. Now you got a wide fish that's turned sideways in the waves. And sometimes they have a little bit of rubbery lips. Sometimes if you haven't got a real good hook set on him, as soon as you lift that rod up to lift him and put him on the beach, guess what? Hook's coming out. Hook's gonna pop out. If you put the tip of the rod down, reel down to it, let the waves be your friend. And this is what I mean. You keep the line tight. Once I see my, yell or my uh, clear leader, I tell the folks, just start walking backwards. A lot of times you'll tighten the drag just a little bit, but if you put it down and the line is tight, let the next wave that's coming in beat your fish. If you keep it tight and you walk him up the beach this way, you'll catch 90% of the fish. You will not pull the hook. I had one, oh, I had people from Fish Bites here a month ago. I got a five pound pompano. A five pound pompano is pretty big. The fish bite detection, straight up and down. I went over, picked the rod up, nothing's on it. I get it in till about 20 yards. The rod bends, nothing's happening. Whether it was hitting the head or something, I don't know. Get him in close, get him in close. I saw what, at first I thought it was a permanent. It was that big. I had a wave, picked that fish up, this bigger fish, surfed him right in, I went over, I picked him up by his tail, hook fell out. 
but the wave, I got the fish because I grabbed them by the tail, but the, my, my point is this, had I lifted that fish, I never would have caught it. Just never would have caught it. So let the elements help you because wave action will definitely help. You don't want a tight drag for a couple different reasons. One's if you get what we call sharked off, you're going to lose everything, it'll go. And bye bye so long, farewell. Or these fish have a tendency to turn sideways and there's a lot of pressure on them. Let the fish do what he wants. That's, it's, really, it's really that simple. Um, there's, there's a couple other things because I think we're getting close. I, I did this page about a year and a half ago, and people, every time I go to a, uh, do a seminar, they ask page 14, and if you folks at uh, Facebook Live don't have this, if you're going to get one page out of this, uh, out of, out of this uh, seminar, out of this handout, this is the one you want, because I, I really believe it, and the people, everybody loves it. Um, things to look for if you aren't getting pompano bites. I go over this constantly with people that I'm fishing with, and there's, there's some real basics that if you pay attention to it, you're going to increase your chances tenfold. What I talked about earlier, you're fishing in off-colored water, brown streaky water. No, it's not clean. I said before, if I'm not setting up in the dark, I do not take a single rod or my cart or anything off of my truck until I see what the color of the water is. Now, that's not to say it can't change on the tide. It can't change with a, with a shot of water coming down the beach, but I want a starting point where I have an opportunity. And the other one, I went over with the rods, you can't reach them. If you're not reaching them, you see some, some people down from you that are casting 40 yards past you, reeling in one after another after another. It's not that they're that much better fishing people, but they're reaching them. You're just not getting out to where they are. Those are the two biggest reasons. The other one, and this, this, is, this is very prevalent. I check my bait every five to 10 minutes, 15 minutes. No, it's usually five to 10 minutes. Depending on, especially with fish bites, depending on the temperature of the water, the rate that it dissolves, if you're using natural bait, the bait that's taken off by crabs or whatever the case may be, I can't tell you how many times people reel in, geez, I don't have any bait, but they haven't checked the bait and it's out 20 or 25 minutes. You just ruined or you just missed 15 minutes and that's usually when they start biting when you don't have any bait. Checking your bait is one of the most basic, but I'm telling you one of the most errors that people make, they do not check the bait often enough. Check the bait. Check the tension on your line, that's what I was talking about. When you have that line out, you're out 70, 80, 90 yards, you want your tip bent. You don't want it straight up and down. Tension on the line, you either have one or you miss one. It's really, really that simple. Right tide, wrong beach. There's a lot of different theories on this. Beaches change, they can change on a daily basis. When we, after we get a big blow in the area, storm, you get a, you know, a northeaster here or eastern 25, 30 knots for three, four, five days in a row, everything changes. You walk up on, I mean, some of the beaches that we had after this last wind situation, there's, there were cliffs. There was that much beach erosion. Well, that sand's got to go somewhere. When the sand goes somewhere, it fills in, but it also makes deep troughs. So here's, here's what I'm, I'm recommending that you do. If you can read the water a little bit, and when I say read the water, there's some beaches up here when you look out and you see white water out an hour after the high tide, that's a sandbar. 
if you see the water start to build, you looking like the wave is going to crest and make white water, but it doesn't crest. That's deeper water. It's very, very evident at low tide. After three or four days of a lot of wind, I actually jump in my truck and I go from St. Lucie Inlet to Fort Pierce with a notebook myself. Now, I, that's a little obsessive, but the, the point is I want to know what's changed. There are a couple beaches here from a week or week and a half ago that had virtually no water in that 50 yard, 60 yard at low tide that now are deep as can be. It changes constantly. If you get a chance, look at the water. If you have white water all the way out, it's going to be shallow. That's simple. Any type of riptide or current that that is going out will make cuts. So the more you do it, the more you can see. If you can find that rip, because you'll see that, you'll see the way the water comes, goes back out, you know, 20, 30 yards, there's probably edges there. That's probably a place you want to be. But low tide is the time to look. So if it's all white water, that means it's shallow and it's flat. But you're going to see, there's a, again, there's another couple beaches that only have it for 100 yards. You'll see white water, no white water, white water. Well, that 100 yards where that white, that water is not breaking, I'll, I'll be there in the morning if the color's good because that's just like a highway in and out. It's going to be deep enough to hold the pompano when they come in and go out. And the other side, it's probably going to wash some bait into that area. Look for life. Uh, Ryan was here today, the fellow that owns Stewart Bait, we were talking about it. The, you know, Big Mac, the Vero Cove areas, holding Spanish mackerel. One of them, I'm not going to have time to go over some of these other fish. Pompano, if you see mackerel, schools of mackerel on the beach, you will know they're mackerel and not bluefish because most of the times you will see the mackerel actually sky. If they're chasing bait, you'll see the whole fish. They could be small ones, they could be big ones. This is the time of year we get the mackerel schools, and they go down to Pex Lake here in Hope Sound, or they've been holding up in Vero Cove. The point is, life breathes life, and the point is there's bait. If there's bait, everything follows suit. But Spanish mackerel and pompano swim together. They like the same type of water. I've got a couple buddies that are mackerel fishermen that do a lot of Vero Cove, whatever the case may be, when they are catching mackerel at Peck's Lake, they usually have somebody on board with a pompano jig, somebody with a pompano jig, trying to jig the pompano that are underneath the mackerel. If you see mackerel, it's a good sign. You might catch, you might get a hook bit off now and then, but look for life. The other thing is when we get a southeast wind up here in this area, it has a tendency to blow seaweed in, sargassum weed. We had a terrible year with, with the weeds. Weeds on your line, what does that do? That's weight. It's not going to be tension set. And I, I see folks all the time that have the line in the water and they'll have maybe just one or two strands of weeds hanging on their line, you're not getting a true read on what's going on with your bait. If you see weeds on your line, if you can shake it off, shake it off. If not, I'm reeling in and I'm, uh, and I'm starting all over again. I'm going to say, it, I just, I can't say it enough. You can't reach them, the water's off color. Those are going to be your two biggest situations. Now, I always like to take a couple minutes and talk about beach etiquette, especially if you're new to doing it. And when I say beach etiquette, this is what I mean. If you see somebody, if you walk up on a beach and you see somebody catch a fish, whether it's a pompano or a whiting, wherever the case may be, and you didn't know any better, you say, boy, I want to fish near that person. And they will take the sand spike and they'll put it right where that chair is. 
away. No, don't do that. There's plenty of room. We have big beaches. Give yourself some room because not only, and if there's some of the commercial folks that do this, you're, you're not going to know their name, but they, they'll probably give you a name because they're going to come walk over to you and, and you're not going to like the name they're going to give you. Just spread it out a little bit. You just don't have to be on top of everybody. Plenty of room, especially suppose you hook the bigger fish, suppose you hook the permit and you're right on top of somebody, you're probably going to get tangled. Tangles, lose fish. The other thing I always take, we, we have a situation here in, in Florida that I say is a blessing. Free beaches. I always leave the beach with more garbage than I had when I got on. I have a five-gallon pail. I pick stuff up. The other thing that I'd like to talk about is adhere to the rules. We have situations where pompano have to be 11 inches. And we have groups of folks that, and it's, believe it or not, it's the same old 2% ruin it for the 98%. They take everything. In your handout, there's an FWC hotline. I, I, I implore you to call that number if you see somebody flagrantly keeping undersized fish limits you can't you know it's six person but the person if they're catch, catching more than that they could have a commercial license but the underside you can pretty well tell when you catch a few pompano you know if it's a keeper I have a measuring device that I keep obviously with me at all times so I know it's going to be 11 inches and there's a list in there of what to take on a day pompano fishing a measuring device is one of them because you really don't want to you don't want to get caught with uh with an undersized fish. If everybody's local here, I will tell you lately, um, like I say, the northern beaches in our area on the Treasure Coast up near Fort Pierce that were excellent fishing three, four weeks ago, that's kind of cooled off a little bit, it's going to change. The fish that we're getting are coming from the north. They migrate, you know, they start in the Carolinas, they come down, they come down. The big schools just haven't got here yet. So just because we didn't catch something up north doesn't mean tomorrow they're not going to show up there. But I'll tell you, if you're going to go out in the next couple days and you're going to try this, based on yesterday, based on this week, there's a whole bunch of beach accesses from the Jensen Traffic Circle south. You got Bob Graham, you got Beachwalk Pasley, you got Bryn Mawr. I mean, I go right down the line. Don't be afraid to try any of them. They are going from north to south. They are, if the water's good, and the normal number of fish that we, that we get this time of year, if they are in fact showing, and everybody hopes they are, um, they could be anywhere. So if you get some decent color, give it a shot. Um, we are we are going to run out of time here. I will tell you that any questions you might have, I will stay as long as you want. Don't think there are no stupid questions when it comes to pompano fishing. None, believe me, zero. But I want to. Alex is going to come up. I want to thank all of you for coming, listening to me for the abbreviated term. There's a lot of information in the handout, other species, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Distance casting, ask me any questions you like, but thank you very much for coming. It was a pleasure having you here, and uh, thank you very much. All right, for our Facebook viewers, we're going to log off here to answer some questions from our audience. If you guys left a comment in the Facebook comment section, Captain Paul is going to get on there following the seminar, and we'll answer any questions or any comments that you have left. Um, our next seminar will be right here in the south end of the Snook Nook parking lot two weeks from now, Thursday, uh, Thursday, January 28th at 5.30 p.m. with popular YouTuber Joey Antonelli and our friends from Tsunami Tackle. For the, all of those who are here, we've actually selected a couple of custom Captain Paul approved surf combos, which will be 
on sale inside, marked down, you know, about 30, 40 bucks on some of them. And with the purchase of a combo, you will also receive a free pompano rig, as well as a free bag of fish bites of your choice. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you all for tuning in. And especially, thank you, Captain Paul. Awesome job as always, man. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much.